guess it's probably a good thing because when you started the interview with me, you were asking about uh, that first show that we did mm -hmm. and that initial experience um, and expectations. Uh, I feel that you're a person who has uh, grown and developed so many different uh, understandings of the music industry. I think it's probably pretty interesting to see what your thoughts were back then as well. Well, uh, I'd come back from uni and I had been doing a lot of comedy up until that point. And uh, I uh, had been writing other things and, you know, doing music in bands, but for fun, really. So when I got back to Sydney, I was just broke and I didn't have a job and I was bored. Um, and I wanted to do music because I had I think I'd sort of done a fair bit of the comedy stuff and, and there wasn't an avenue for that <clears throat> when I moved back. So um, I, just was doing it for, I just was doing it for fun. I, I mean, I did want, I always want to do something excellent. That's the goal. Um, and I, you know, always intend to make it as good as it can be for whatever it is, um, which implies a level of limitation to some degree too. Um, but realistically, what happened with Blue Juice was uh, I... I had nothing to do. I'd met this guy, Campbell, who uh, played in a band called Entropic at the time. And he said, you should go and sit in on this uh, other band's gig. They're, they've got a bass player and a drummer, but they don't have anything else, really. And um, you kind of want to do some performing, so maybe that's a good place to try and do that. And I'd never really kind of fronted a band. I'd played drums and, um, and stuff, but never really kind of performed in front of one. So I thought, that's a good, that sounds good. You know, they had a regular gig at the Three Eyes Monkeys, a pretty average pub. Uh, you'd never go there to see music. I thought, that's harmless, no one will know. Um, so I turned up on this Saturday or Friday night uh, when they had a residency, and it was my friend Ned and Jamie from school, and nobody told me that it was them, you know. So I was shocked to see that, because I'd known Ned since I was five and, uh, and Jamie since I was about 13. And instantly I was like, oh, this could be really fun. And, uh, and then we started doing it. We didn't have any songs, and we'd do it for about three hours at a time and just improvise. And it was pretty bad, like, you know, it was pretty boring acid jazz, <laughs> like kind of like horrible disco funk with not very good playing that went on a long time and with the same vocal for like, I don't know, an hour, you know. Um, and then Jerry turned up and started playing keys and he was really different again. Um, <clears throat> he's from that sort of mountain scene and, and we didn't know him but he liked the gig so that all started working and then Stav turned up and, um, and he, I knew him through the guy that makes our video clips but only incidentally. Um, he wanted to do comedy, but he, just, he liked music and um, he'd never thought of being in a band at all, had never done any performing of any variety uh, and got up uh, at one of those shows and sat down and did this weird kind of quiet verse, like Snoop Dogg verse or something, and then, then kept coming back and eventually just decided he was our manager. Like he came back two times and then the third time he was carrying our gear out and we were like, why are you doing that? He's like, because I'm managing the band now. And I was like, oh, all right. Um, so it's not like anyone actually asked him to be in the band, it just sort of happened. And, uh, and, the same, and it's the same for every member of that band. So really with that band, I never thought it would go anywhere. Um, and in fact, what I noticed about it was the only good thing about it was that it was heaps of fun. And everyone who was doing it seemed to be having a lot of fun doing it. And it was energetic, you know? But it was very uh, unsophisticated. And it, I mean, really unsophisticated. If you think it's unsophisticated now, you should have seen it at the start. It was terrible, you know? Um, it was just like noise and, and just self-harm, basically. That was the whole vibe of the shows. Um, but it had an effect on audiences and, and I guess I did want to kind of provide an alternative to my friends who are in bands who are all very good, um, like Holly Throsby and, um, and that kind of scene of like new folk who are really, really talented, but kind of very serious. And there was a lot of um, quite serious uh, bands around and, and there was a bit of a divide between the audience and performer, I thought, and people weren't kind of re relaxed and loosened up. So really all I wanted to do with that band was to get it good enough so that we could do those kinds of shows and be a bit of an alternative to that and maybe have a couple of songs that could go to radio that would have the same feel. But, but it was so far from what I thought we could do because we were so shit, you know? Like, and I was ashamed of that band and, and to some degree still am. I mean, we're, it's never what we imagine it to be. It never works out like we want it to, it, even though when it, and when it does, it works out much better than we thought it would. You know, it's, all, it's always a confusion of expectations, that band. And so in some ways, it's too difficult to, to expect too much for that group. Yeah, uh, because so, two, so there can't be too many bands that have a premise of two stand-up comics as yeah. the, the yeah. front man. Yeah, it's an odd idea. And um, it's not like, you know, 
that's really what it is in a way, but, it's, um, but you always are trying to get away from that when you talk about it because you're kind of uncomfortable about the idea of it. But it allows, I think, the sense of humour in the band allows it to move between many genres and, uh, and still be itself. And that's a great freedom with that group. Um, it means that we can do a lot of different things and that's been lucky and also added to some longevity for the band despite the fact that stylistically it's changed a fair bit over the last few records. Um, I think everything about it is an odd fit, to be honest. Um, and that can be a really good thing and it can be a really bad thing. The only reason why we ever got to deal with anyone or, um, or management was because vitriol happened and it was undeniably popular on alternative radio. And at that point, people had to say, well, maybe there's something to this group. Um, but if that hadn't happened, there's no way we would have progressed beyond the stage that we were working at. We would have played Surrey Hills Festival a few times and, you know, probably broken up. So You come from a journalistic background where you have a real great... To, um, passion for music and you also have a real foothold in various different aspects of the music industry whether it be um, on judging panels whether it be working for music magazines yeah. all these different and, and doing radio stuff you have a real idea about um, music and opinions about that whereas you have other people in the band who are purely creative and, and perhaps come from a come at it from a different angle. They're a bit looser about it or a bit more kind of like humanistic about it, I guess. Yeah, does that, how much tension arises a lot. from, yeah. A lot. Yeah. Like, I can't even say how much, but, um, but it's necessary because the industry itself is a harsh thing. You know, people aren't lying to you when they say that the music industry is very quick to dismiss. Um, and in order to keep people's attention and get the things across that you want to get across, you have to keep pace with it. Uh, and also, there, beyond that, which is a fairly dry reason, there's a lot of things to be excited about with new music. You know, new, new, new music's happening constantly. Uh, and as we get older, uh, music stays 18 forever, you know. Um, and in order to, to be interested and to be relevant, you have to have an ear to that. Uh, and it's not easy. I think it's a lot harder than anyone gives, gives uh, a, a developing musician credit for. It's a real skill to stay up, up to pace with that. I'm not saying I've done it at all. In fact, I'm only enthusiastically trying to do it. Um, but, but there are other elements of the group that don't feel the need to worry about those things or worry about the machinations of uh, label politics or how a single might come out or, you know, and so it's sort of up to me to think about that with Stav. Um, and then Jerry and, uh, and Jamie, you know, they think more about the APRA side of things because they both worked at APRA and looked after the songwriting rights and, and stuff like that and, and then they also just kind of want to play. I think Jerry just likes to play and and uh, kind of wants to do whatever it is that he wants to do. Do you is... have different goals? Yeah, I think so. But I think, I think our goals in that band are similar in that we want the band to be successful and we want to make good music with the band. And that's kind of the thing that keeps everyone together. Um, I mean, we're not so dissimilar that we can't hang out, you know, on tour and stuff like that. We definitely spend all of our time. I mean, we've been together for nine years, you know. It's a long time to be in a band. Um, and uh, I think we get each other enough to know not to argue about the things that are likely to come up as, as points of argument. Yeah. And that's, that's saved the relationship, yeah. A, a, uh, a respect, and whether it's grudging or whether it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it comes from a different angle, it's still a respect. Yeah. yeah, you've done some fucked up stuff to one another in the past, so you don't want to keep doing that. You know, when you're younger, you say and do things to each other that are very full on, and I can be a really cruel cool person when I want to be. And, um, and Jerry can be an annoying prick. Yeah. And so those two, like that stubbornness and my like stabbing at him, those two things aren't really good to keep happening forever because they will destroy a band, you know, so. So you write for your music, but you also write for yeah, the yeah. job as well. And yeah. Which is another thing that every artist that I know does, does uh, washes dishes, yeah. uh, parks cars, uh, does a bit of graphic design. I don't actually get paid for the journalism so much. I could, I don't invoice that much because I'm terrible with money. Um, but I, I don't, I just do it honestly just because I love it. Um, it's weird, it's like a reverse scenario. I get paid by the band to live and then I do the other stuff as kind of a passion. Yeah. Um, and the band is, yeah, yeah, I mean, look, the band is my passion, but, um, but it's my stable income as well. Uh, so that means that when I think about the next record, of course I'm considering how it's going to go. And also you have management pressure and label pressure to sell. Um, 
and we've only recently in the space of one record signed to a, what is essentially kind of a subsidiary major, you know. Um, so there is that pressure, real pressure on us to sell those things now uh, and do that, be a commercial band. Uh, so it's something I kind of try and consider in a work sense. And then the other things like talking to um, artists like yourself or talking to uh, industry people as, in, as an interviewer or, or on a panel um, is more f for the creative and intellectual engagement as to why this, why music is exciting, why artists are exciting. Another thing that I'm really interested in, <laughs> and being on the receiving end of, I want to take it back to writing a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, being on the receiving end of, you know, sometimes harsh reviews. <laughs> yeah. Because you put a lot of passion into it. And actually yeah. what you expect from a writer is really, uh, really good listening. <laughs> uh, you prefer to get that sometimes, maybe not always at the, at the time, but in retrospect, um, then you know, stuff that is really just marketing fodder yeah, stuff that you can, you can re, reprint. Um, what I'm not, I'm not wanting to give you a hard time. I think it's that. okay to do that. It's an interview, you should. Yeah, <laughs> I, but it's not really what I'm interested in. What, what I'm sort of interested in is because you, we, we're in a small pond, you know, uh, yeah. I know that we've had a little bit of international travel, but you will be touring or seeing a lot of these groups that you're reviewing. Mm. Do you... Someone's it, playing with them, you know. Yeah, how does it... It must come up a bit. A lot of people ha hate it. Yeah. Um, but I just kind of have this attitude that it's just like, if you just staunch that attitude, they'll fuck off or they'll come around. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the way it is with people. You just have to do it. You have to stick it in if you, if you mean it. And at the time... Look, I, the worst thing about it is, is that you can really be wrong. Um, or your attitudes can change. Or your take on a song can change. I mean, no one's perfect with... Um, with Music criticism, I think it's a, it is unfortunately very mood-based as well. Um, but there are certain tenets of it that sort of sit somewhere in a stable kind of... And to, most of the time when I look back at things that I've kind of panned or really loved, I still agree with those strong opinions. And, and things have turned out to some degree. Like we were just talking about Jezebel's, you know. I remember being very excited about that band, seeing them early on. There was really obviously something there. And a lot of people weren't interested in that band. A lot of people thought they were an unfashionable group or thought that there wasn't, the lyrics were stupid, like Disco Biscuit Love was a stupid so song title and therefore wouldn't program it for a major radio station and stuff like that. All that stuff is bullshit over time, you know, and, and that's the thing that'll sort it all out is time. Uh, maybe people won't give you credit for having said or thought those things, but you know that you did. Um, and that's, that's my attitude with writing. It's like, I don't believe a 45 to 50 year old person who's worked in this industry knows any better about this industry or how to, ta or how to hear music than I do. Mm. And I don't think they ever have. So if people want to disagree, that's fine. I'll debate the merits of the review and, uh, and seriously and, and will be willing to be wrong. Um, but I won't, I won't not say it. That puts a bit of pressure on you to wear two hats a little bit more because of the contentiousness of it. Right? Yeah, fuck it. You don't care? It doesn't no, bother you? Nah, not really. You don't mind the fact that you don't, that uh, there is easy ways to avoid the conflict? I don't see the point in avoiding it. We, we're, if we avoid it and if everyone wants to avoid it, we end up with this, as you say, just marketing fodder. That's what music press is. It's a tide of shit. There is so much bullshit nothing that goes on in this industry and talk about crap. Bands that are promoted way out of the spectrum of what they can actually do. People's dreams get built up massively and shattered because someone thinks that they're the next top thing and they aren't. You know, <clears throat> they deliberately go about making themselves the next top thing and do really well out of it for two singles and then don't do anything, rock off with heaps of money and, and spend the rest of the time laughing at people who are struggling to do something good who are actually very talented. But that... Um, the basic tenets and attitudes in this industry make me want to fight, and, and I don't see any problem with that. I think that it's a necessary thing to do, you know? I like it and, uh, on that note. Hmm. Thanks for the chat. <laughs> yeah. Nice one. Yeah.